Hello, I'm Bonnie Herbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, a weekly discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. What a week it was news-wise on issues concerning sexual harassment and assault. As New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, a longtime star of the Democratic Party, resigned his position as governor. This after the release of a report by his state attorney general documenting 11 women's accounts of sexual assault and harassment by Governor Cuomo. The organization formed to file lawsuits against alleged sexual predators was also dragged into the story this week. Time's Up board member, a prominent progressive women's rights lawyer, Roberta Kaplan, resigned her board slot as well. It was reported in the New York Attorney General's probe that she and Tina Chen, the Obama administration's executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls, advised Cuomo on a letter he wanted to release defending himself against those allegations. With us to discuss her reporting on this important story is Rebecca Keegan, senior editor of The Hollywood Reporter. Rebecca, welcome and thank you for your time. Some of your articles are just amazing about what women were doing to women when the women at Time's Up were supposed to be helping sexual assault victims. Let's start with Roberta Kaplan, please, and then I'll ask you more. Okay, uh, Roberta Kaplan, it was revealed in the New York State Attorney General's report about Andrew Cuomo is alleged to have provided some counsel or some advice to Cuomo on how to handle the PR fallout from these allegations. This is something that was really upsetting to many women who are sexual assault or sexual harassment survivors. A group of them, including some Time's Up clients, penned an open letter to the organization because they were so upset by it. And what did it say? The group said that they feel that Time's Up has chosen proximity to power over supporting victims. They feel that Time's Up relationship with Governor Cuomo, which the organization had forged over the course of working on some legislation, clouded its judgment um, when it came to talking to him about these sexual harassment allegations. How deep in the organization do you believe um, siding with the wrong side, if that's a short way to put it, which is what some of these women were apparently doing? Um, how deep do you think it goes? I mean, K Kaplan was on the board. Um, we have tried to get interviews with women We've interviewed many times, have been on the panel who were with Time's Up. Nobody wants to talk about it. What are they running away from? Well, it's complicated. You know, Time's Up was not created like so many uh, nonprofit organizations. It was not created as a sort of grassroots organization. It was created in Hollywood agencies. Because of that, this organization has extraordinary resources and proximity to power, which many women felt would be a great thing that could be used on behalf of survivors and victims. And in some ways it has. There are thousands of women who've gotten help from the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund. But at the same time that the group has these relationships with powerful people, it finds itself in what you might consider compromising positions. There are a few examples of that that predate the controversy over Cuomo. One is that uh, the organization has a very close relationship with Oprah Winfrey. When she backed away from a documentary about Russell Simmons accusers, many uh, survivors and victims felt that Time's Up sided with Oprah Winfrey over the Russell Simmons accusers. There was also a case where a group who were members of Time's Up Healthcare, doctors and nurses, left Time's Up because they were upset with the way the organization handled an allegation against a key leader at Time's Up. Oprah Winfrey, was she a funder? Is she a funder Oprah of Time's Up? She's a, she's a very well-known benefactor of many causes. Absolutely. She was a huge figure for Time's Up 
particularly in the early days. I don't know if you remember the at the Golden Globes in 2018, which was when the organization announced itself. It's when many actresses arrived wearing black and with um, sort of important activists on their arm instead of your usual dates. Um, Oprah gave a very, very powerful speech at that Golden Globes in which she talked about Time's Up and money began pouring into the organization. She's probably their most important mouthpiece. And so when she found herself in this, um, you could call it a dilemma uh, with regard to the treatment of the victims in the Russell Simmons case, many, many women's groups signed an open letter supporting the victims. The, who were in this documentary called On the Record. Time's Up initially opted not to and seemed to side with her in this sort of dispute. And that really upset a lot of uh, victims and survivors. Time's Up was obviously financially very successful in terms of fundraising and, um, and supporting very expensive lawsuits by accusers against powerful uh, alleged abusers. So um, do you think it's possible, I mean, you cover Hollywood, so you know about the relationships, the, you know, the deals between agents and, and actors, both male and female, et cetera, non-binary. Um, is it possible to raise a lot of money without I wouldn't say sleeping with the enemy, but siding with the enemy sometimes? That's really the core question uh, that survivors have about Time's Up. Some of the most important early donors are companies that found themselves at the center of some harassment scandals. Um, for instance, CBS, CAA, the major Hollywood agency. This was the agency that had set up the meeting a young and Harvey Weinstein, um, and CAA sort of incubated Time's Up. So uh, NCAA and all of the other agencies were aware of the major gender pay disparities between what male and female actors make. So some outsiders have asked themselves, how can these companies and these people who were at the center of creating the current problems in Hollywood be the architects of fixing them? There's another more generous way to look at it, which is people realized that the situation was wrong and needed to be changed. There's some very well-intentioned people at, at some of those companies, um, a group of female agents who were horrified by what was going on at their companies and Time's Up was a way for them to do something about it. But there's this way the organization was founded. And I think the Cuomo uh, scandal sort of points to that exact issue. Tell me about the, uh, re the the relationship between the donors like like CIA and and then there was also on the part of some people within um, within times up of self enrichment in a way right yeah I mean times up is a is a complicated organization it has many parts. There's the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which is a totally separate organization from the Time's Up that does political lobbying. And one of the challenges for me as a reporter covering them has been getting more transparency into their finances, into how the, you know, sort of different leaders in different parts of the organization, how they work, how their staff works. It's one of the issues that the survivors who signed this open letter have raised this sort of lack of transparency at Time's Up. You know, it is a, a nonprofit, so it, it does need to file paperwork um, with the federal government to explain some of these things. And it's been slower to do that than you would think for an organization with such deep pockets and um, with such sort of educated, powerful, aware people in, in who uh, took part in its founding. Um, there's a, Maureen Dowd had an interesting column in the New York Times in response to uh, Time's Up's problems, and she referred back to an 18th century British novelist who wrote a novel about a, an abuser who was a rich man, headed a household full of women servants, and the chief maid or the chief housekeeper uh, actually held a young teenage girl down in bed so he could rape her 
and her column was all about how women have um, frequently been the uh, the beards, if you will, of of abusing men while they're abusing other women. That was certainly the case with Harvey Weinstein and uh, some of his aides who helped him procure, uh, you know, solo meetings in hotel rooms with some really uh, famous, big name female Hollywood uh, people. Uh, tell me what you know about the history of women and, and what you see in Hollywood about women, uh, you know, who uh, stand by men as they watch them abuse women, sexual assault and, and sexual harassment. Well, for a long time in Hollywood, there was rarely room for more than one woman in a room, one female executive, one female agent. And I think there was a culture that emerged of some women looking out for themselves. It wasn't all women who did that, but some women felt it necessary to be very tough, look out for their own interests and their own interests only. Um, I do think the industry is, has evolved out of that, but there's a whole generation of women who worked around um, Harvey Weinstein and a generation of women who are now powerful lawyers, powerful executives, people kind of at the peaks of their careers, and they grew up in that. And I think that has affected the way some of them have looked at these issues. Um, do you know anything specifically about what Kaplan was advising the Cuomo team in terms of public relations? Well, there's, a, there's what's in the attorney general's report, which says that, uh, an aide to Cuomo showed Kaplan a letter that the uh, governor's office was planning to distribute, which impugned one of the women who was bringing uh, sexual harassment allegations. And according to the state attorney general's report, Kaplan and Tina Chen gave the advice that the letter would be okay to run with with taking out some portion of it, which refers to the woman's relationships with other men. Um, Time's Up has disputed that version of events. They say they, they didn't advise on the letter, um, but it's, it's quite specifically laid out and attributed to a specific aid in the attorney general's report. Now, Time's Up has issued a statement saying, essentially that the organization has come clean, but do you agree with that or, are there other uh, women who need to leave uh, or who, as we're, you know, you've reported this story, are there inklings of other women involved in things that are unacceptable and will have to leave the organization or is it just Kaplan? I don't know. I mean, Roberta Kaplan is a, is a major figure in, in Time's Up. She was part of its founding. She's a prominent progressive lawyer who had played a role um, in the same-sex marriage legalization. And for many people, she was a really important advocate and is a really important advocate for women. Her stepping away from the organization is a big deal. And it signals, I think, that Time's Up is starting to hear the critics who have problems with its relationships with powerful people. Um, Kaplan said in her resignation letter that she had begun to feel that her role as a working attorney was incompatible with being on Time's Up's board. So uh, that's a major statement that Time's Up is making saying, we're taking you seriously, uh, critics. They also talked in their uh, statement about greater transparency at the organization. What exactly that means, uh, I, I think is, is to be seen, we'll have to see in the coming months how exactly the organization changes, how much more it shares about its inner workings, which have been a little bit difficult to parse. Um, now, uh, what when Chen and Kaplan consulted on this letter, did the Cuomo organization make a donation to Time's Up? Was there payment to the two women individually? And um, what is Kaplan, who is, as you say, a progressive lawyer, uh, obviously went to law school, studied legal ethics. 
the, I'm a lawyer, although I never practiced, but I went to law school and passed the bar. Um, I would know better than to consult on a letter like that uh, while being on the board of, of an op, you know, the, the major organization that was formed to fight sexual harassment and sexual assault. No allegation of a sort of financial quid pro quo, pro, quid pro quo although Kaplan's firm represents uh, one of Cuomo's aides. So there is that relationship that exists. I think the issue that led them to sort of want to talk to Cuomo, hear him out, help him if that was appropriate, was this relationship they'd had with him in passing this 2019 legislation. I mean, this is where it gets tricky because they had a close relationship with Cuomo. They were able to participate in passing what a lot of people consider very important legislation for women. It extended the statute of limitations for rape in New York state. And so you can see that there's not, they're getting money from this relationship, but in their minds, probably this relationship is important to women and in the larger sense. It's complicated is when they find themselves being asked to help Cuomo when he's facing these allegations. Right, of course, and particularly before he got in much trouble, Zoom her, her cons those consultations occurred before it got the the you know report was released, which is just recently, and um, and it made well. I mean, obviously, they saw in the letter that he was refuting pretty serious allegations, and I guess they knew that the uh, Attorney General of New York was gonna be issuing this report on it. Um, you know, where do you think they should have drawn the line? You know, I don't know. I'm not an expert on, on legal ethics. I've just covered this organization as a reporter. And what I know is that the women who have been coming to Time's Up with cases of sexual harassment in their workplace, cases of sexual assault, they feel the line. They feel that this was not an appropriate use of the organization's resources, expertise. And many of them are frustrated because they've got cases that Time's Up is, in their opinions, slow to take action. They feel that because they are not famous or prominent, they haven't gotten serious treatment from Time's Up. And so when they see Governor Cuomo, who is uh, alleged to have harassed, I think it's alleged at this point, when they see that Time's Up has the time for him and not for them, that is where these people feel the organization is really crossing a line. What's the future for Time's Up? You think they're going to, I don't know how much money they have, what their budget is annually. I don't know how much they have in the bank or how much they have in promised donations, but will they be able financially to withstand uh, this, this uh, tidal wave of bad publicity? It's a good question and I honestly don't know. I don't know how this will affect future donations to the group. Um, the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund has an enormous reserve of money and you know, in the tens of millions, but the other part of the organization, which is the part that does the lobbying, doesn't have as much money. And they are constantly sending out fundraising appeals. So will being at the center of this scandal affect their ability to raise money? You know, for a lot of prominent and wealthy people in Hollywood, giving a donation, a big donation to Time's Up was a sort of a way to say that you were on the side of good when it came to gender issues. And now I think that's less clear. And so people who have donated more than $500,000, so that's people like Meryl Streep, Steven Spielberg, Reese Witherspoon, will they say, well, you know, there are these other organizations that do good things for women. Maybe I'll put my money there. Sure, that would be a natural reaction. Um, what, what impact has, Time's up, and I'm going to confuse it here, mix mix things here up a little bit, but the Me Too movement had on the casting couch culture in Hollywood, if you will. Uh, is it, do male directors still feel that they can demand sex um, 
or at least try for it in a one-on-one -on -one meeting in a hotel room with an actress, actor, female actor? Well, there have been some major changes uh, sparked by the Weinstein revelations. Among them is the fact that people are no longer meetings in hotel rooms, which was regular practice in Hollywood, not only for people like Weinstein who wanted to use them for nefarious purposes, but just for people who found it convenient. But there's an awareness now that that is not a workplace environment and, and not a, a place for one-on-one -on -one meetings in Hollywood. So that practice is really waning. Um, and certainly among very prominent people, they are finding that it is just too dangerous for them to do it because of the perception um, where they ever had an intention of uh, coming on to someone or not, don't want to be put in a position where they could be accused of that. So the hotel room meetings are going away. Another thing that's changed is there are what are called intimacy coordinators on sets now. And their job is to sort of help manage nude scenes, love scenes, situations where people may have had trouble protecting their boundaries on a set. These intimacy coordinators are now in regular practice on Hollywood sets and they talk with the actors and the director about how these scenes are gonna work. So there are some concrete things that have changed. Um, I do hear probably once or twice a month from people with stories of harassment or assault at their Hollywood workplaces. Oftentimes now it's smaller venues. It's a documentary shoot around the world. It's a short film shoot. It's people who are sort of outside that big uh, kind of nexus of power that Weinstein was a part of. So it's still happening. I think it's happening less as far as I can tell. So you think they definitely have had an impact on on the uh, the, the feeling by men in Hollywood to that women were just fair game if they wanted employment. Um, but but that there it's still going on kind of like, you know, we talk about wage laws and how, uh, you know, and the freedom to work from home for mothers, which is great if you're working remotely for a big company and making good money. But if you're a waitress in Louisiana making, I think the minimum wage there is maybe $5 an hour. Um, it, it's that, you know, it, it just doesn't apply. So same thing here, smaller companies still have a lot of uh, that kind of corruption going on? I mean, there's very much a caste system in Hollywood. And, it, you know, at big studios like Disney and Netflix, there are procedures in place to try and prevent these kinds of things from happening. But there are a lot of small independent companies. They don't have human resources departments. They don't have um, a lot of the sort of infrastructure in place that has been created to help protect people in the workplace. And those are the settings increasingly where I'm hearing about these problems. They're also less powerful women who are uh, experiencing them. So it's not um, Gwyneth Paltrow and Angelina Jolie. It is a director's assistant on a teeny tiny TV show. You know, it's a, it's a production assistant. It's a woman with a lot less power and in an environment where she's gonna have a much harder time sort of getting, getting results or getting help. When you raise the issue of putting procedures in place to prevent these kinds of things, and of course, when you talk about the casting couch, you don't usually think of whatever was going on in front of the cameras, because that would be a fairly, not that abuses couldn't happen, and of course they did, but you think more about private meetings, and not in a, not in a scene when you're on a shoot, but at somebody's office, at a hotel, at their house, etc. cetera. Uh, somebody told me years ago, after Andrew Cuomo, within the first year after he was elected, and this is a person who's, pretty high up in New York state government that he always demanded that a staffer be with him in the room anytime he was meeting with a woman because he always wanted somebody there to, in, in case there were ever allegations, somebody there could say, no, I was at the meeting that never happened. So, so what does that say about putting 
prevent and then you know years later this comes out i guess it really matters who's in the room and whether they have the power to speak up um, to the cuomo figure or the powerful director whoever it is if they depend on that person for a paycheck it might be hard for them to express their concern right well again thank you rebecca keegan so much for your time you are, of course, a senior editor at The Hollywood Reporter. Thank you so much for the information. And you are covering uh, the problems with the Time's Up movement and other women and power issues in Hollywood. Thank you again. It's been extremely informative. I'm Bonnie Urbay. That's it for this edition. Please continue the conversation with us on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. And whether you agree or think, to the contrary, please join us next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary.